I've constantly had to learn deeper and deeper concepts in analysis since I entered university in 2014 to study physics, then in the master's to study pure mathematics, and then in the PhD in pure mathematics as well, which I never completed, by the way. First of all, I need to tell you guys that the formula that I'm going to share in this video is something that worked pretty well, at least for me. The very first thing I do whenever I want to learn anything, not only analysis, is to start with intuition. You know, there will be three points in this video. The second and third will be specific for analysis, but the first one is just a rule of thumb. When I say intuition, I mean a non-rigorous or even sloppy explanation of the concepts. Let's see an illustration. Say we want to learn what the limit of a function is. Take the function f of x equals 1 over x, for example. Its graph looks like this. Notice how the curve gets closer and closer to the x-axis here, without ever touching or crossing it. A similar thing happens for these other parts of the graph. The function gets closer and closer to the axis without ever touching or crossing them. Intuitively, we can study how the points in the vertical y-axis behave as we move towards the right, so to plus infinity in the x-axis. The relation between the points in the x-axis and in the y-axis are conditioned by the function f of x equals 1 over x. And we express it this way, the limit with x that tends to plus infinity of 1 over x. Let's take this point right here, x equals 1. We see that its value in y is 1 over 1, so 1. Since we need to make x tend to plus infinity, we pick the next point on the right side of x equals 1. Let's try x equals 3. Now y equals 1 over 3. For x equals 10, y is 1 over 10, and so on. We notice a pattern here. The more we move towards the right in the x-axis, the more we end up moving down in the y-axis towards 0. So we can conclude that when x tends to plus infinity, y tends to 0. In other words, the limit with x that tends to plus infinity of 1 over x is 0. Let's see what happens for x that tends to minus infinity. Pick this point in x, and we get this point in y. So the more we move to the left in x, the more we move up in y towards 0 again. The conclusion is that the limit with x that tends to minus infinity of 1 over x is 0. Now we analyze what happens in this region of the graph. If we pick this point for x, then y is this one. We move x closer to 0, and y moves up. We notice that the closer we get to 0 in the x-axis, the higher is the value of y, without any boundary. In other words, the limit with x that tends to 0 of 1 over x is plus infinity. Actually, this equation is not completely right when expressed this way. In order to understand what I mean by that, let's check out the function's behavior at this lower part of the graph. As x tends to 0 now, y tends to minus infinity. So, how is it possible that minus infinity equals this limit, which equals plus infinity? So, minus infinity equals plus infinity? Simple. It isn't. In fact, one of the most basic theorems in analysis is the one that says that the limit of a function at a point must be unique. So, since there is an ambiguity here, we say that there is no limit with x that tends to 0 of 1 over x. Instead, a more appropriate expression would be this, the limit with x that tends to 0 from the right side of 1 over x is plus infinity, with a plus sign on top of 0, so that we know that x tends to 0 from the right side, the positive side. Meanwhile, the limit with x that tends to 0 from the left side of 1 over x is minus infinity. I don't know if you can remember yourself when you were just learning these concepts, or if you were literally learning them for the first time right here. This explanation, at least in my opinion, is a very clear one. It illustrates very well what the limit of a function is, why we calculate it, and what we can expect the result to look like. After creating the solid intuition behind the concept of the limit of a function, you not only can, but you must move to the second step, which is to reshape it into a more abstract or general way. 
abstraction. Analysis is heavily proof-based. So eventually, you do have to mature from just the intuition to a deeper understanding of the concepts in a rigorous way. My advice is this. Don't try just to memorize definitions. Try to dissect them. You need to ask yourself, why is each condition necessary? What happens if I remove or alter a part of the definition? Especially when studying proofs, you need to identify the key ideas first, like why a particular technique is chosen to prove what you want. So, people can have different opinions about it, but I find very useful to study proof as a sort of story that is being told to me, with all of its chronological events in order. This way, you can clearly understand the reason behind every calculation or new definitions that are introduced on the way. And you can also keep in mind what you wanted to prove in the first place. Now that we have a good feeling of what the limit of a function is, and most importantly, what our goal is, let's see its formal definition in terms of epsilon and delta. This is written in mathematical language, of course, but I'll read it while translating into English. For every tiny positive number epsilon, no matter how small, there exists another tiny positive number delta, such that whenever x is within the distance delta from a, but not equal to a, the value of f of x is within the distance epsilon from l. Take your time to digest it. This is actually the particular case in which x tends to a finite number a, and the result of the limit is finite as well, the value l here. The other three cases for the definition of the limit of a function will be added to the PDF link that you guys can find, as usual, in the description below. Notice, though, that just because the limit of a function with x that tends to a finite value a is finite, so l, it doesn't mean that the function itself is continuous at that point. In other words, it doesn't mean that f of a equals l. Let's see a counterexample. Consider the function f of x equals x squared if x is not 1 or 3 if x is 1. The limit of this function as x tends to 1 is 1. This is true for the limit from the right and from the left of x equals 1. So this limit does exist. However, when we look for the value of the function exactly at the point x equals 1, we find out that f of 1 is 3. So its limit with x that tends to 1 is not equal to f of 1. And thus we say that f of x is not continuous at the point x equals 1. In fact, the rigorous definition of a continuous function is not the same as the definition of the limit of a function. If you want to see this definition using epsilon and delta, check out the PDF link in the description below. I added some discussion about it and also some insights about the intuition behind it. So far we saw intuition and abstraction. Now it's time to move to the last step in the process of learning analysis. Practice. What do I mean by that? I mean actually creating concrete examples of your own. This way you can perform practical calculations. And it's kind of a way of testing your intuition. And it's a very nice way to jump from just the intuition to the abstraction. So try to create examples involving numbers. Let's illustrate it with the limit with x that tends to zero from the right side of the natural logarithm of x, which equals minus infinity. The graph of this function looks like this. And we can clearly see how the function indeed tends to minus infinity when x tends to 0 plus. Notice that the function has no values for x less than 0. Its rigorous definition is the following. For every negative number m, there exists a number delta positive, such that whenever x is between 0 and delta, we have that the number ln of x is less than m. Let's see it on the graph. Pick any negative value m in the vertical axis. No matter how low it is, there's always a possible choice of a tiny delta such that you can find a value x in the horizontal axis that gives us a value ln of x even lower than the previously chosen m. Again, no matter how low m is, you can always find a point ln of x lower than that. Of course, looking at the graph, it's kind of an obvious fact, but we need to show it analytically. 
so rigorously. For every m negative, our goal is to find a delta positive such that whenever x is between 0 and delta, we also have as a consequence that ln of x is less than m. So, at the end of the day, ln of x less than m is what we want to prove, and so we should focus our attention on it. ln of x is less than m implies that, exponentiating both sides, e to the power of ln of x is less than e to the power of m, which implies that x is less than e to the power of m. So, what delta should we pick for each value of m? What about delta equal to e to the power of m? This is not the only possible choice, but we'll see now that this choice does work. For any m negative, there exists a delta, which we define as e to the power of m, such that whenever x is between 0 and e to the power of m, we have that x is less than e to the power of m. And this implies that, now taking the natural logarithm in both sides, ln of x is less than m. So indeed, delta equals e to the power of m is one of the right choices that guarantees that no matter how low the value of m is, there is always a delta, small enough, that let us find a point below m in the vertical axis. Notice that if instead the function were f of x equals minus ln of x, then this argument would fail. What do I mean by that? Let's try to prove that. For every negative number m, there exists delta positive, such that whenever x is between 0 and delta, we have that minus ln of x is less than m. This is not going to be true. But once again, we focus on what we actually want to prove. Minus ln of x less than m implies that ln of x is greater than minus m, which implies that e to the power of ln of x is greater than e to the power of minus m which implies that x is greater than 1 over e to the power of m. So now, x is greater than something, which is the opposite of what we got in the previous example, which was x less than something else. This means that we cannot find smaller and smaller values of delta that satisfy any choice of m. Instead, we need to find larger and larger values of delta. We actually show it that the limit with x that tends to plus infinity of minus ln of x is minus infinity. This last step is so important. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to practice with concrete calculations. It really helps you to solidify the concepts. And it is also strongly supported by neuroscience. Our brains are malleable, even after we become adults, which means that connections in our brains rewire themselves during learning. Basically, we physically alter the connections inside of our brain and make a structural change when we are learning. But an important term to remember is cognitive load. In order to properly process the information, you have to organize, contrast, and compare the ideas. So, the more you focus on problem solving, the better you will retain the information. In other words, after grasping the intuition and the abstract rigor of a specific definition in analysis, you need to practice it with concrete examples, concrete problems over and over again. And this is the best way to learn analysis. This video was a little different than what we usually do. So, please let us know in the comment section below if you guys like this kind of mix between personal advice about how to study a specific subject and also some technical calculations on the way. Do not forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And if you like this video, I'm pretty sure you're gonna love this one, guys. See you there.